interoperability. The future. It's all lies. Now I'm covered in sweat. Give me a hug. Give me a hug.
it's a lot more to the battery life. Look at the battery right now. Yeah, that's like the battery life. Yeah, I know. There's no separate way to use it. Oh. memory. Man. Do you know how this strip is on? <laughs> I don't believe so. That's like a mini hole. Exactly. Yeah, we're definitely not going to go. Yeah, you're not going to go. We love it. It's probably true. Yes, Freaking Linux machine. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> 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 Alright, so that's gonna die in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're, we're all adapted. This surge protector isn't getting power. Yeah, we're Yeah, yeah, we're, we don't have power on either one here. Does anybody? Can you hear me in the back? <laughs> Uh, 
So you can't have a game with your own account. Yeah. Oh, we just shared our presentation with you so that you could do it better, right? Yeah. We figured you were already logged in at this point for this whole mess of game. <laughs> and the Benny Hill theme tune. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Social Machines 3. We're going to be here for uh, the next hour and a half. Uh, so first up we have Nick, Eric and May uh, talking about Beyond Talk Pages. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Sorry for the long wait. Thank you for the patience. I'm uh, Nick Wilson, uh, user of Quiddity. Been an editor since 2005. Uh, I'm currently working as the community liaison for the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, working for the core features team on the Flow product. Um, with me today is Mae Galloway, the lead designer, and Eric. and Eric Bernhardson, the tech lead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been working on Flow since September 2013, and today we're going to talk about the current state of the feature and what the roadmap looks like for the next year or so. Uh, the topic today is beyond talk pages, supporting collaboration with Flow. First, we're going to talk about the value of a discussion system in a wiki project. Discussion pages are a crucial element for effective collaboration. And if you can't discuss things with other contributors, then life is basically just a series of depressing edit wars. Discussion is also crucial for bringing new people into the project. It turns out a lot of people don't actually read the manual. Becoming familiar with the project's goals, guidelines, and workflows is an interactive process that often involves having conversations with a number of people uh, as you go along. Uh, someone said to me many, many years ago, you're not a real Wikimedian until you've made at least 50 mistakes. Uh, since we're working on such an important part of the collaboration process, we have to start by identifying what the value of the current talk page system is. Yeah. One thing that's distinctive about wiki discussions, in comparison to many of the other discussion systems on the web, is that people tend to talk in complete paragraphs. The open page discussion system that we have encourages people to spread out and have long, thoughtful conversations. Another important feature is the conversations on talk pages are part of the history of the collaborative work. Discussions are supposed to stick around, either on the original page or in an archive. Another thing that's useful is when discussions are closely integrated with all the other activity on the wiki. So when you look at someone's contributions, you can see the discussions that they've participated in right alongside the work that they're doing on article pages and all the other parts of the wiki, or wikis. Uh, finally, and this is something that's making our lives kind of complicated in the flow team, the free form blank space that's currently offered on talk pages has allowed decades worth of hacks and workarounds to develop. There are some processes that run on talk page templates, on, which on another platform would be handled in a completely different way, but it provided the blank space for the uh, communities to experiment with. That being said, there are a number of pain points associated with talk pages that are limiting the platform's ability to grow. The disadvantages for new users for, uh, who are learning to use talk pages are pretty extreme and they affect every part of the experience. There are five major ones. First up, where do I actually start writing? Do I start a new conversation at the top of the page? Do I scroll down to the bottom as we actually want currently? Do I create a new heading for it and how? There's a new tab section at the top of the page, but it's not necessarily obvious to new users that there's a button to press when you want to start a new discussion thread. Then there's where do I, uh, where, where do I reply? Do I write back directly underneath the person who wrote to me if it's on my user talk page, or should I go to the, their user talk page and reply there? 
a bunch of uh, editors have instructions at the top of their user talk page or in their signature or in an edit notice explaining where they prefer that you reply. Along with that comes the mystery of the colons. We use colons for indenting to mark a separation between people's posts, but that's a cultural practice that isn't explicitly supported by the software. When we add a break uh, in a long conversation or an out then to some wikis use, uh, is something that people can potentially learn from observation. And if you want to reply to someone but there's already a reply, do you use the same level of indent or do you go one further level? Uh, many of us, I'm sure, have seen the confused comments from someone saying, uh, a confused discussion between two people saying, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't replying to you. I was replying to the person before you. I just added another level of indent because that's what everyone tends to do. Uh, as for signatures, the first thing you have to do when you're introducing someone to the pro any project is, hello, nice to meet you, and if you want to reply to me, please add four tildes after your comment, otherwise on some project, Signbot will come along and uh, make you feel kind of stupid. The most damaging pain point uh, for new users is the uh, getting to know how to use the watch list system uh, for notifications. Uh, you can pick up how to use colons and equal signs by looking at wiki text, but there's nothing in the software currently that helps a new person learn that you can start, if you start a conversation or if you participate in a conversation, then you need to put that on your watch list and then pay attention to your watch list as a way to find out if you have any messages. Plus you need to also, you, or you don't need to, uh, you can also use diffs, uh, which are thoroughly confusing if you're not used to that aspect of technology. Notifications is a, another solved problem on various sites, and the media wiki approach to it was not what people have come to expect, although we're working on that, and Echo was launched last year around this time, and that's been one of the more, more successful products. Uh, pain points for experienced users are quite different. We've all adapted to the existing tools in a huge variety of ways. We're often keeping track of or involved in dozens to hundreds of ongoing discussions. We might just want to watch the changes through an article or project page and not have every discussion change in our watch list. Or we might want to watch a single thread on a busy notice board. Some highly active editors use watch lists. Some editors use the email me when a page on my watch list to change its feature. And some editors just visit a handful of pages and rely on their memory to figure out where new things have appeared. Those of us who do use a watch list or a history page and are familiar with this, uh, can figure out what's going on, but it's still fairly labor intensive to track down where within a topic or which topic if the header isn't part of the diff, the reply came. Uh, those of us who skim down looking for new comments have to either read timestamps or just rely upon our visual memory to figure out what's changed since the last time we were there. Uh, it's cumbersome, cumbersome to search the archives if the archive box template uh, with the little search entry under the number of pages hasn't been set up with a search parameter and if we're not sure which discussion or which page this discussion was on. With those pain points in mind, there are three major themes for the Flow project. The new system will be more accessible for new users. It will be more efficient for experienced users. And because wiki conversations are an important part of the collaboration process, we want to build a system that helps everyone keep track of the conversations they're involved in. You shouldn't miss messages accidentally because you didn't realize that the new messages were there. Uh, this is an example of a core use case for an article talk. Uh, so fix it discussion. A user sees as a problem on an article page, but for whatever, whatever reason, they don't feel empowered to actually make the change themselves. In this case, it's an article about a Doctor Who story where the plot summary was too long. A user is asking on the talk page, shouldn't this be shorter? Another user replies in a very polite way, so fix it. And basically grants the user the permission they were looking for um, in order to do this. In this case, the first user comes back and says, great, I was worried they might ever get reverted. I'll work on it now. And if you look closely at this conversation, you can see that the original post was in July, and the question didn't actually get answered until November. That's almost four months later. Luckily, when the answer came, the first user was still around and eager to make the change once they felt they had the backing to do it. It would probably be a good thing if our new system encouraged people to respond with a faster turnaround than four months. This is a simple user talk conversation uh, talking about George Melier, the French filmmaker who made the film uh, Trip to the Moon. Uh, these are two people who are both very interested in a specific piece of film history. And if you look at the George Melier filmography talk page, you can basically watch them becoming fast friends, as I did, um, on the page together. It's a perfect example of the excitement that can come when you're collaborating with someone 
asking questions and inspiring each other to find new information sources. This user talk conversation is early in that relationship, a moment when one of them steps back from the conversation about the article on the article talk page and says thanks on the other user's user talk page. And this is the kind of connection that we want to really support with Flow. The other use case is that we want to support is the mentorship and help spaces, areas that are often connection points between new users and experienced users. This is one of, one of the areas where a targeted notification system is really important. We want Flow to support meaningful conversations, and the most basic definition of meaningful is someone asks a question and someone else answers it. Then the person who asks the question actually comes back to read the answer. We need a good notification system to make sure that connection happens. Once we've got the simple use cases covered, then we move on to the more challenging ones. Most of these involve bots, templates, and workflows. Uh, for user talk pages, there are a lot of template-based notices and warnings. And some of them are manual, some bot delivered. If we're going to offer flow for user talk pages, then obviously we need to support these or improve on them. There have been a few requests for flow to handle a more easily tweakable template or all the warning templates that we give. Uh, so that we can tweak the tone of the message, the, the default message, to suit the recipient before we actually save it. For article and project talk pages, there are many processes that require multiple long steps. Uh, we often huge pages of instructions and details and examples to teach us how to do it. Uh, newcomers are often put off from even trying. Um, occasionally they'll ask for help or ask someone else to do it. Experienced editors uh, who engage in some of the processes kind of rarely will often, like myself, will often have to reread the instructions every single time they do it. Um, some of the editors who find themselves doing a process really frequently will rely on tools like Twinkle and other helper scripts to automate it. Adding discussions to the listings of the related wiki projects, as G3K does uh, for many years, to my huge appreciation. Um, it's an incredibly tedious manual task right now and should be fairly automatable with into the wiki project categories. Uh, there are some similar processes that are, are automated on the larger Wikipedias by bots, but setting up the infrastructure of templates and bots in each language takes a lot of time. Finally, we've got the most complex use cases, and these are the ones that everyone asks about with good reason. They're very important and require significantly more features than the basic user talk and article talk. The first is a checklist or a scratch pad use case. Uh, a group of people are working together on a page or a project and they need a space to list out the things they're working on, discuss each item, ask questions, and then mark the status as done or incomplete or various. This use case uh, definitely includes discussions, but the conversations are there to support the larger task list framework. We know that Flow needs to support this use case, but we don't know what it should look like yet. That's something that we're going to need to work out, figure out as we get there, and we really open to ideas and suggestions from you. The one thing we don't know for sure is that edit a completely blank page is not the most accessible or efficient way to solve this problem. The other complex use case are the RFC style voting and consensus building process. These involve a structured framework for multi-level discussions, including a way to express opposition or support and then a way to break that conversation down into multiple lines of sub-thread discussion. This is the other area we don't know too much about. Uh, we know we need to build extra features to support this level of complexity, but we don't know exactly how this is gonna work, and we know that we need to give some people something better than a blank page. I wish them luck. Sure. So right now I'm gonna be talking about what we've done so far. Uh, what we've done so far is to look at uh, what we can do to support simple use cases that Nick just uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, what we're currently working on is the is to hey, support. Hey, can you do better with the microphone? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> First thing that we looked at is just to support basic conversation, uh, aim mainly for new users. So as you can see here, you can start a new topic, write some description, and next, and you can reply to topics and discussions. <laughs> and when that's done, the system would auto-generate a timestamp as well as. Um, 
your username, so you don't need to do what you used to do. Or have new users figure out what they have to do. So full board is basically a series of individual discussion in a board that you can, yes. So on the left is actually uh, an extended view of the full board, and on the right is a condensed view of the full board. Yeah. Currently an experimental feature that we're going to be re-examining. But I'm just showing here that you know in a full board you have individual topics. So in these, in this full uh, full board, you can actually now sort according to the uh, recently active topics as well as the newest topics that we just created. And uh, making the discussion thread as a basic unit enables us to do many more things uh, to find and participate. So like, for example, we can think about grouping uh, these conversations together, r regardless of where they were created, like which full board they were created. We can group these discussions together according to their, how related they are uh, to each other. And this will not only give us, uh, you know, the flexibility to do more things, but also for uh, bots and gadget writers to do more things. The next thing that we've been looking at is individual topic subscription. So basically, it, it just enables you to subscribe to a topic that you like, and to the ones that you don't like, you can unsubscribe. And it automatically uh, subscribes the topic if you create it. So what happens when you subscribe to a topic is you get notifications. Uh, we're working on the ability to subscribe to the entire full board so you get future new topics that were created in the board. The next thing is highlighting new messages. So let's say you have a new, new notification and you click on it. It brings you to this page and you don't need to go look for where is the new message. It highlights it for you exactly where it is until you read it. So the next thing is uh, moderation tools. On every single post and uh, topics, you get the options like you see here, and uh, we've been we've been uh, experimenting with high that we will we will re-examine soon and that we'll talk about later. But uh, it it just enables people to hide inappropriate posts or topics, and uh, for admins and oversiders to delete or suppress any of them. So a few months ago, we also add this feature called uh, summarizing and closing a topic. Summarizing the topic includes an area for uh, short summarization details or check mark done template or other templates like articles for deletion. This simplifies and enhances the current practice that we're doing with indented and italic line at the top of the thread. Um, the close feature though is a part of a feature to replace the current mark as resolve templates um, such as archive top template and there are still other other options and polish to these features, but as you can see, it it can really help with the current awkward and inconsistently implemented tasks. Right now, we are on 16 Media Wiki and English Wikipedia sites, and soon we want to uh, look into uh, make our appearances and mentorship spaces on English Wikipedia in the fall. So I'll pass it back to. You. So now you're gonna, we're going to show you what we're, what we're working on now and what we'll, you'll see live in about a month. Never miss a message is a really important theme for the Flow team. Wiki conversations aren't like a Facebook or Tumblr feed, Facebook or Tumblr feed, where you check in every once in a while and see what's new. If you happen to miss something, it doesn't really matter. Where if someone, whereas if somebody's asked a question on a Wiki talk page, they're waiting for a serious answer. The current echo notification system isn't smart enough to help you manage that. Right now, all notifications are immediately marked as red as soon as you open the flyout panel. And if you have more pending notifications than that in the flyout menu, then you have to click through to all notifications to see the rest. The upgraded notifications panel is going to split out messages and alerts. Uh, me 
messages is for plug conversations, and alerts is for all the other current echo notifications. Thanks, warnings, mentions, etc. The alert side won't change very much right now, but the messages side has some interesting differences coming soon. For one thing, the flow notifications will roll up a bundle, as we're calling it, to reflect all of the new messages in a conversation that you subscribe to. You'll only get one notification per thread, so you won't have multiple things about the same conversation. You'll see all the unread notifications in the panel, and you'll have a scroll bar, so if, if you've got more notifications, you can see all of them when you fall up in the flyout. The new notifications will have a more responsive red, unread state. Uh, a notification is read if you click on the notification, or if you visit the topic page by itself, or if you post a new message on that topic. Uh, you can also click the mark all as read to clear all of them. Uh, the main goal is to help us keep track of which discussions have new posts that we should pay attention to, and also give us ways to filter out the discussions that we're not really interested in right now. Uh, we're also working on cleaning up the UI on the mobile web to make it easier to check in on current discussions when you're on a phone or a tablet. This is another area that Flow has the potential to make uh, life easier for experienced users. Uh, it should be easy for contributors to read and respond to new discussion messages when you don't have your desktop or laptop in front of you. Uh, writing a Flow message should be a lot easier on your phone than editing a current talk page. Uh, as always with the new product, uh, we need to think about how we can measure the impact of the features and uh, help guide us through the next stages of development. Uh, these are the kinds of examples of the things that we're going to be keeping an eye on. One of the most important measures is the first one listed here. When someone asks a question and there's a reply, we want to see what the person who asked the question comes back and actually read the answer. That's how we know that Flow is actually helping people to make connections that support the active collaboration. One way to measure that is to see how often the person who started the discussion comes back and responds after a reply, and then compare that to what's currently happening on a comparable talk page. Uh, here's a small part of the roadmap for the coming quarter. Uh, the search team is working on integrating the Flow database into search. They plan to have a search box on each Flow board, as well as integrate it into the normal advanced site search. Uh, a table of contents is going to be added soon uh, as a way to navigate quickly between threads. Uh, it'll include uh, controls at the bottom to load more and possibly include some of the metadata that's currently in the, uh, the great topic title book. Uh, much of which is there just to test out and demonstrate the possibilities. Uh, the hide part of the metadata uh, moderation system of the hide, delete, suppress which is oversight is going to be re-examined uh, as, as this experimental feature hasn't been working out as well as desired. The team plans to do additional work on content handler which will enable the rollback undo links in the history page so that simple spam and tests can be reverted just as they normally are. Uh, for the API, there's still a lot of documentation yet to be written, but it is functional, and there are plans to begin reaching out to the bot operators for input and for assistance in both directions. There's uh, some more work has to be done with the what links here category system to prepare that for integration with the existing category and template based workflows, and that'll provide the transitional support until more modular workflows are available in the future. As we approach these complex use cases, like checklists and voting discussions, we're going to need to collaborate a lot more with all the experienced Wikimedians. The goal of making Flow more accessible to new users is easy. They've got that one pretty much nailed down. But the second goal of making the Wiki discussion system more efficient for experienced users is tougher and more interesting challenge. Uh, we're currently experimenting, testing, and trying out new things. The one thing that we know absolutely for sure is that it's possible to make the wiki discussion system more efficient and less stressful, even for experienced users, especially for experienced users. And doing that will be a huge benefit for all of our projects. We want to work in partnership with more of the people, you, who care the most about making media wiki communication system more focused on content and ideas and less focused on interface workarounds. We hope you'll start or continue to help us uh, with feedback, suggestions, demands, concerns, bug reports, and pointers over the coming months and years, just as many editors have been doing over the previous months to whom we're immensely grateful. Just like any complex tool, we can, it, it can only improve with your diverse input and patience and long-term vision. There's a lot to do, and it's worth doing well. And that's it. Questions?
Go for it. Um, so one of the things that we tell editors, new editors all the time, is if you find a problem with an article, leave a message on the top page. And then they leave a message on the top page, and nobody reads it, and nobody responds to it. And then they email OTRS saying, I followed your instructions to leave a message on the top page, and nobody cares. Uh, is there any plan to actually use both to try and, I don't know, flag up issues, be able to actually essentially start building something more like a bug tracker? <coughs> and I know the horror of having Bugzilla attached to the <laughs> media or something. <laughs> point, but like, it seems a bit silly that we're telling people to post on talk pages that nobody's watching and nobody cares about. I was actually talking to somebody about this exactly last night, um, and hopefully that, that, that we were sort of brainstorming late last night about uh, potentially getting unwatched topics integrated into the, um, the wiki project uh, to-do list thing. So I forget the term. Um, but yeah, that, that should be done. The, the only danger we'd have to avoid is the fact that non-admins can't see uh, low-watched pages. So we'd have to to, to figure that out. That uh, that's an idea that actually feeds into some affiliation software work that's based on global profile. Um, and we can talk about that. I've been dealing with that issue with the easy solution is to tell people if you don't get a reply within a week. Pick a mic, please. Then you put the whole state templates on. No. Do you have a mic that we can carry around and give the people? Just repeat the question. Repeat the question, yeah. So you, so you, you follow up. The idea is you follow up with the um, top page message by putting it to one of the healthy templates on. So, so the, the question was, um, how do you deal with the fact that some top pages are very, very low watch, and so some people will leave a message and it won't get a reply to, what do you do next? And so discussions are continuing. What, what was your answer? So when you're telling people to put the stuff on the top page, you say, if you don't get a response in a week, then you put a help me template on uh, so if they don't get a response in a week, tell them to put a help me template on the talk page. But certainly as a manual solution, I mean, it'd be nice. We want to try and make it easy for newer people, so ideally, like, we could automate that in some way. Or yeah. we, we don't know exactly but what that's we're going to do, but, but with continued input yeah. from you guys, I'm sure we can build something great. So the question is, where is the interface for editors to give feedback on design in general or design on flow? Part of the discussion loop with, that would be part of the editor engagement department, I guess, which is what I'm also part of. Um, so it's, it's a case of figuring out mass messaging and improving notice boards and... So, the flow portal? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's asking where the flow portal is. Um, go to MediaWiki and flow. The um, second one. Yeah. Second one. And anything you post on the on the talk flow page, that's something that we're monitoring regularly. Uh, Plenty of experienced users come by and, and give us their opinion. Uh, it happens quite regularly. Let's go. Uh, as far as I understood, you <coughs> added a new feature to the talk pages, the topic feature. What can be moderated and so on and so on. First question is, um, what is the, the, the integration path? Do we have to have new talk pages? Ah, no, um, unfortunately not. The conversion process currently in a very, uh, a, a, the very early stages 
is to uh, request the page be converted. Uh, we're not really rolling out any further until there's a lot more polish and a couple of new features like search are probably integrated. Um, but uh, essentially the flow devs will turn on a page and then uh, archive the previous page and move the headers across and we're going to automate that. Like uh, install PHP BB or something? Yeah, something like that. Um, so, so the problem is that's not going to integrate with special contributions. It's not going to integrate with what links here. It's not going to integrate with everything that the MediaWiki user base expects. Somebody who has sysop privileges on the MediaWiki is not going to necessarily have it on the PHP BB because it's an entirely independent piece of software. Um, I think at least that, that users really expect some level of integration and doing it with an external forum software, I, I just think you'd be doing almost as much work and you wouldn't be getting the same level of, uh, of integration out of it. It was something that we researched early on and we can talk afterwards to find the actual practice and then give you some more detail. Okay. Yeah, here keeps raising his hand. And what, when do you guess this might get uh, deployed? So, it depends on your <laughs> definition of deployed. So currently, uh, as I mentioned like two pages ago, it is on like 16 pages. But that's, that's intentionally incredibly limited because we know it's not ready yet. And uh, so it's going to take a lot of feedback from you guys before it's actually ready for millions of pages across all the Wikipedias. I, I would not expect to see it on a million pages by the next Wikimania. But if you all give us enough uh, feedback that we can build something, that it might be possible, but, but I expect it's going to take a little while. So if you go to MediaWiki.org, Wiki Talk Flow, that will be one of the of the pages. Uh, both the first uh, first and third link there are. Okay, if, if you want to try it and post random things, please use the sandbox rather than talk flow, so you don't yep. uh, your post will end up getting deleted or something on talk flow. Okay, somewhere in the back keeps Kim. Kim, and then I think we're running out of time. Kim burning. Hi. Yeah, I just had one question. Um, a lot of systems sometimes they don't do what you want. So, you can go back to using regular wiki text in a single block or whatever, or the first section of your discussion. So, so the question is essentially, could you have, so, so currently it's a list of topics. The question is, could one of those not be a topic at all? Could it be just a plain bit of wiki text that people do whatever they want with? Because Take a flow board and revert it back to a top page. No, I need a product board. Just otherwise, part otherwise you destroy everything. Just individual individual topics. Yeah. It's not something I've specifically thought about. I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, we considered separate things like sandboxes, where you have a collaborative editing area that that can be essentially transcluded into the topic. But we haven't yet considered a way to uh, to no, do as you had suggested. Well, this, what I've said, what I'm saying in general is just you know, it doesn't matter how you what you make it exactly. Just to have an escape, you know, in the context, context like you have the escape to escape out of your limited character set or escape out, of, you know, have a flow escape. With. I mean, that, that that would definitely work for experienced users. I'm I'm afraid that if there is an escape, that you're going to suddenly have these areas that only that only experienced users are going to be able to use. A new user is going to come in and be like, how do I reply to this? Well, I, I know, but I, I, would, I, would, accept, I, would, I would accept that. Okay, and then I'm going to stop and give the next question. Okay. I, would, I would accept that there would be areas like that temporarily, and then you would, uh, of course, as time to proceed, you would find ways to also new users for that. But not having this station means that the, uh, the implementation of flow would end up being held up, because we can't do X, even if that's something very rare. I mean, that, that, that never really ties into why I don't expect it to be fully deployed by next year. There, there are a lot of things that we have to, to do before it can go out that far. Hopefully we can address it. But, uh, let's go in the middle. I think we're out of time. Are we out of time? Oh, all right. One more here in the middle. So due to community feedback, we are currently only supporting wiki text. Um, it is something we intend to support. We actually have code in there that could be just flipped a switch and it would turn on. 
But currently, we want to keep people focused on specifically the Flow software and not on integration points with other things like the visual editor. Uh, because there's a, lot of, there's a long way to go just with, with Flow before you even talk about having the other editors integrated. But we do have a way to put it in there, and it is on the, on the plan, certainly. And it does use Parsley already. Yeah, both the Wikitext Wiki Wiki toolbar Parsley and Parsley uh, visual editor toolbar will both be available. Yeah. So, so the, the question is, can I get a whole topic diff? Uh, the general answer there is we've been trying to not provide a full topic diff because if you grab any random person off the street and you show them a diff and you say, what's happening here? They, they have no clue. Um, it's great for experienced users, but I'm convinced that with some thought and with some effort that there are better ways than a diff. Like, we're trying out right now with the highlighted posts. We could do things with collapsing unread posts. There's, there's a wide variety of things we could do that I think are much more powerful and more intuitive than a diff. But we don't know exactly what they are yet. We'll be experimenting with them over the coming months. And your feedback on the things that we send out, things will definitely change based on your feedback. Um, help us out. So because Flow is so new, it has not been released as part of the, the, the open source media wiki, media wiki code, so it doesn't necessarily track directly to 1.24. Our goal is that with 1.25, we're going to split off a branch, we're going to offer guaranteed support for that, where we backport things and, and make sure it works. But so right now, not yet. You could try it out, but you'd have to install the same version that's running on, on the Wikipedia sites. We're out of time now, but uh, thank you very much. We'll be in the community village for the next three days. Uh, come find us at the designer user, uh, user user experience table and the community engagement advocacy table. And I'm Nick, Eric, and May. Just give us a couple of seconds to get this figured out.
Okay, uh, please welcome our next speaker, Dario. He's going to be talking about measuring community health, vital signs for Wikimedia projects. All right. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me fine? I guess you can. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So today we're going to talk about measurements. And um, um, I want to show you what we're up to the Wikimedia Foundation. This is a joint presentation with um, Aaron Halfaker and uh, who's here, and uh, uh, our colleagues who are in San Francisco at the moment uh, from the NDXF team. Uh, and basically, we want to give you a sense of uh, what we've been doing in terms of uh, making uh, data about the Wikimedia projects uh, more accessible uh, to the community and to researchers who want to study what's going on in our projects. Um, so I want to start with two caveats. So there's a, the first one is that, uh, uh, oh, you can't really read this, but it, what it says is that metrics are not science. So um, there's a common temptation in taking simple measurements um, as a surrogate for proper research and making some hand rating statements about uh, you know, causal relations. And, uh, um, and I think focusing on good measurements uh, is an important precondition for research. It's not a replacement for research. So that's the first caveat. When we talk about metrics, this is really enabling for the research. Um, however, the way I like to think about metrics uh, is as filters. So in other words, the lenses that we can use to try and identify interesting phenomena uh, on an ongoing basis that are more being investigated uh, and they would go otherwise unnoticed. Um, so with these caveats, uh, uh, when I step back and, and discuss uh, uh, what we've been up to with metrics recently at the foundation. So those of you who were with Mania last year or who are somehow involved in a uh, program evaluation, I uh, may know that last summer we released a project uh, called Wikimetrics, whose goal was to facilitate the generation of uh, simple measurements for arbitrarily chosen groups of users, right? So um, the idea is that uh, with Wikimetrics, uh, you pick, for example, uh, a group of users, uh, of editors enrolled uh, in a um, Wikipedia education uh, program um, course, right? And you call them uh, a core. So that's a technical term we use for users. Um, and Wikimetrics allows you to generate uh, measurements about uh, the volume of contributions, the uh, nature and quality of contribution of these users, their retention, their short-term and long-term retention. Uh, in other words, it allows you to understand basically what this group of users as a whole uh, is uh, contributing to the projects. Now, um, measuring core level performance in itself is only meaningful if you have an interesting baseline to compare it to. Um, in other words, uh, you might be able to say, when I look at the uh, productivity of these users, and I compare it with the, uh, the overall population of the project they contribute to, I might be able to say that, for example, these users are have a significantly higher productivity than the, uh, the rest of the population, right? So moving from courts uh, to, to project level metrics is really fundamental uh, for this comparison. Um, but at the same time, project level metrics are interesting themselves because they help us understand uh, the dynamics of a project, the growth of a project, uh, and also how different projects uh, compare with each other, right? So you want to say whether, you want to check whether the uh, uh, French Wikipedia and Russian Wikipedia are following roughly the same dynamics, whether one is uh, healthier, whether one is working better than the other. So uh, this is what we're going to talk about today, so project level metrics. And um, as you may know, historically, the foundation has been maintaining two main sources of uh, project level statistics. One is Wikistats, the other one is uh, uh, the Wikimedia Report Card. Just a quick check, uh, have you heard of this project before? Can you raise your hands? Yes, okay, you're good. Um, so Wikistats, Wikistats uh, provides a very extensive and comprehensive overview of uh, project level metrics for all of our uh, projects. Um, however, these metrics are generated uh, slowly. Uh, most of this data comes from uh, the dumps, and the dumps are generated uh, 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 over the course of uh, several days in most cases. Um, and as a result, uh, 
the, these metrics are, are updated uh, uh, once a month, mostly. Um, they also mostly capture public data that is in the dumps, and as a result, uh, uh, all the other data that we have in the uh, production databases that basically reflects uh, the activity of our users, uh, their registrations, whether they edit on uh, on mobile uh, on the mobile side or on the desktop side, is not available via the dumps. So we're missing all this granular information is available by the databases. Um, on the other hand, we have the report card. The report card is a, a provides a nice visual interface uh, to uh, a curated subset of metrics, uh, most of which can be really generated at a faster rate. Uh, the, the typical source uh, is the database uh, or instrumentation data. Um, however, the report card is limited to a subset of projects. So typically, the top Wikipedias or a bunch of projects, or for some reason, the foundation cares about presenting uh, on the official report card. So if you were to ask me today, what is the current uh, rate uh, of uh, unreverted edits uh, on the Arabic Wikipedia, my honest answer would be, I don't know. I would need to look it up. I would need to run some ad hoc analysis and check what's, what's going on on the Arabic Wikipedia. So we have no way of uh, capturing what's going on on uh, different projects uh, on a regular basis um, uh, using these two, these two legacy um, tools that we've been maintaining uh, in the past years. And so that's where the uh, have a problem with the network. Let's see. Um, awesome. um, so that's where the, uh, the Vital Sign, sign Project uh, uh, fits in. So uh, we've been working on this project, uh, um, and again, it's a collaboration between the research team and the analytic development team. And the goal of this project is really to produce a, a granular measurement of a, a bunch of different uh, variables we care about. So they're related to user engagement, they're related to the, uh, the growth and the size of the community, they're related to the, 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 the growth of content and dynamics of content. Um, they would be aggregated different time resolutions, so starting from daily data, but also weekly and monthly. Um, they would be generated automatically for all projects. So if you're interested in French wiki source, then you're not gonna be a second class citizen, but you're gonna have the same data generated for any, any other project. Uh, and finally, they will be presented both via uh, interactive visualizations, but also raw data. So you can download the data set and do whatever analysis you want to do with, uh, with, with this project. Um, and there's a, there's a link here you can follow where you can uh, read about the, uh, the specifications and the uh, planning of this project. And so um, this is giving you a, a, a high level overview of uh, what we're talking about. So we're uh, roughly categorizing all these metrics under four broad categories that capture interesting information about uh, new users, so users who just register on uh, uh, Wikimedia projects, um, metrics about the existing communities, so existing users and the population of uh, active or very active uh, uh, users, including bots and page creators, media creators, etc. Uh, we have metrics about content, um, so again, edits, new pages created, media uploaded, uh, and then we have a fourth category of metrics about uh, curation activity, so deletions, reverts, uh, uh, page moves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this list is still being uh, expanded, so we're working on the, uh, on the metric definition, but we're give you a sense of uh, how we're uh, tackling this problem and what's the process that uh, goes from the identification of interesting phenomenon to measure to the actual specification that we're, uh, that we're proposing. So um, first off, we try to follow some high level principles uh, to make sure that not only these metrics capture some interesting phenomena, um, but also make sure that uh, uh, we have uh, definitions that are easily replicable and verifiable, uh, that we provide uh, transparent uh, formal definitions that remove ambiguity in interpreting these metrics. They're consistent, so that we know that we measure one project and another project, uh, we're not comparing apples to oranges. Um, but they're robust, so that we can uh, generate them by multiple data sources, ideally. And finally, they're grinder, meaning that uh, we can generate them at arbitrarily um, different uh, time resolutions. And so, uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, these pages that you can find on Meta under the research uh, um, namespace. Uh, where we really try and uh, uh, articulate the process uh, that um, 
we're following for generating these metric recommendations. This is a typical uh, example of a metric page. Um, and it includes a, a human readable definition of the metric, what this metric stands for. Um, a specification that is a machine readable. You can see it here, but it will be a, a SQL specification of how to generate that, um, that metric. Um, we also have a visualization to help uh, explain how the metric was modeled and, uh, uh, and, and describe the different uh, um, terminology involved in the definition of this metric. These are just examples of the diagrams that we have on uh, these pages. And finally, and most importantly, we have a section where we discuss um, all the assumptions behind this metric and uh, the limitations, because uh, obviously these being metrics, uh, they will be able to measure something accurately and it will be edge cases that are not really capturing well. Um, but also all the parameters that go into the definition of a metric. You think of a metric basically as a, as a formula that depends on a number of parameters and the choice of the parameters is going to be really important because uh, depending on the parameter, you'll be measuring different things. And that leads us to the, uh, uh, the next uh, stage uh, in this metric uh, uh, recommendations and that's the sensitive analysis. So the idea is that uh, uh, we, don't want, we don't want to make uh, arbitrary choices about uh, how we uh, define these metrics. We want to make sure that we have robust definitions that can apply uh, across projects uh, and over time and basically capture the same things uh, regardless of where they're, they're applied. So we engage in a pretty extensive, oh, I'm sorry you cannot really see that plot very well, but we, you can look them up on, on that. Uh, but we basically engage in a pretty extensive uh, sensitivity analysis uh, where we look at a specific choice of parameters and we see by moving these parameters whether the metric uh, really starts capturing something different or not. Um, so for example, um, we looked at, uh, so we have this definition for what we call uh, a productive new user. And a productive new user is a user, is a newly registered user who contributes to, uh, to a project uh, and has at least one unreverted contribution within a given time period since registration. And so the question that we had here was, uh, well, what happens if we change that period from one day to one week? Or what happens if we change uh, that uh, parameter to uh, five edits as opposed to one edit? And what you can see here is that uh, this is basically a plot of uh, different courts registered uh, uh, from 2003 to uh, today. And it plots the proportion of uh, productive new editors out of the total population of new registered users. And you can see the two solid lines uh, are mo almost uh, undistinguishable, meaning that uh, choosing one day or a one week period makes uh, uh, no difference uh, in, the, uh, in the modeling of this metric. Whereas uh, uh, choosing one edit or five edits actually does make a difference. So this, this specific parameter value uh, captures different things as a function of how you set it. And so the same applies uh, to uh, the sensitivity analysis across projects. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, if we measure something on the German Wikipedia uh, with a given parameter set, uh, we capture the, uh, the same thing in a different project. And this is a comparison of uh, um, uh, the, um, basically we look at different projects and we take uh, the definition of new editors that is currently defined as uh, the, um, the, the rate at which new users uh, reach one edit, one or more edits uh, within the first 24 hours uh, of registration. And as you can see, uh, this is plotting the proportion of these, uh, these editors who contribute to the article namespace out of the total namespaces. As you can see, the proportion is a uh, constant over time and is roughly the same uh, for all of these projects. So that's a good indication that we might rely on uh, uh, the specific uh, uh, article namespace or all namespaces would be just measuring the same thing, uh, barring a constant factor. And so uh, aside from sensitivity analysis, uh, we're also interested in uh, the ability of segmenting user population. Um, the, the most important, or historically the most important metric that the Wikimedia Foundation and Movement uh, uh, have been looking at uh, is uh, active editors. And active editors are a very coarse metric that can be driven by many different factors and many different parts of the population of, uh, uh, of our projects. And so one of our goals here is to try and come up with uh, definitions that can be broken down into their respective drivers. So this is an example of how we're taking the legacy active editor definition and we're trying to isolate the different population that really drive these numbers. And this diagram represents basically how we're computing activity with respect to the registration time of these users 
And what it basically shows you is that uh, active editors uh, can be considered as a sum of uh, new active editors. So basically, people who just registered and became active editors um, on top of uh, surviving new active editors. So people come back and, and, and keep editing one month after registering. And then recurring old active editors and editors who are uh, reactivated after a period of uh, silence uh, on the project. So segmentation is really one of the other big goals uh, that we're trying to uh, um, uh, to hit with this project. So why why does this matter at all, and what's the point of going through this uh, through this effort? Um, I think there are a couple of use cases that are really important. The first one is uh, uh, data exploration. Like I said, uh, uh, we've never been in a position in which we publish all of this data and make it available to the community and to researchers. And having these data readily available for all projects by default is going to allow us to explore what's happening in, a, um, in given projects uh, and to, to realize that, for example, the activation rate, uh, the rate at which new users uh, become um, um, new editors is very different across projects. Uh, and there will be projects that maybe have a higher activation rate, but a lower absolute number of new editors. So comparisons that historically we haven't been able to do unless we generate this, these numbers uh, manually. But on top of that, I think it even more importantly, we'll be able to run what uh, uh, researchers call natural experiments or, or field experiments. So we'll be looking at naturally occurring interventions in many communities, right? Um, like for example, uh, a change in abuse filter rules or a change in permission levels or basically anything that affects the, uh, the way in which a specific community functions. And we might be able to find, looking at this series of uh, signals that we're collecting, that uh, a change that was driven by the community had a positive effect uh, on the retention or the productivity of the users. Again, uh, interventions right now go unnoticed because we have no way of monitoring them on an ongoing basis. And finally, and this is more like an internal use case, so we've been using for the first time uh, these breakdowns uh, in, um, in terms of uh, different segments of the population to make better projections uh, and to um, set targets for uh, different uh, product teams. So for example, uh, we know that uh, at the moment to, uh, to stop the activity decline we've been observing on many, um, on many projects, like large projects like the English Wikipedia or the German Wikipedia, we can make pretty tangible uh, uh, projections about uh, the increase that we need to see in any of the subcomponents in order to stop the decline. And this is important because we can determine whether we're getting closer to hitting the target or whether we're completely wrong, basically. So um, a quick update to what we're building and where we are at uh, with this project in terms of uh, actual infrastructure. Uh, so first off, the analytics de uh, development team has been really working hard uh, to ensure that uh, we have a, a robust process for generating all of these data points uh, on a regular basis for uh, 800 plus projects. And uh, uh, there's a quick demo that I'll try and show you here. Nope. Okay, yeah. So as I think it's pretty understandable is a prototype, and uh, the idea is that uh, we didn't want to get people too attached to the actual presentation of this data, but this is just to give you a sense uh, of the fact that uh, for all of these projects uh, we're generating now, uh, the entire time series going back to a, couple of, uh, um, to a couple of years. So for example, you can check uh, what's happening the RAGBIC, um, Wikipedia in, term, in terms of uh, year registrations, let's see. Trackpad, please help me. It's a button, yes. Yay, okay. <laughs> um, and basically compare it with um, any any other arbitrary project. Uh, um, right, and so this data is generated daily uh, and although it looks like pretty ambitious, keep in mind that uh, uh, for every single metric we're going to have, uh, if you consider that as a single data point uh, for each of these metrics for a type of project, we're going to have uh, around 300,000 data points uh, per year per metric. Um, 
And so uh, the same applies to um, to other metrics that the, uh, the dev team has already implemented. But basically, this is just to give you a sense of uh, uh, what the data looks like. Uh, now, this is not going to be the way in which the data is presented. And uh, in fact, we worked with the uh, UX team right, on the information architecture and data presentation later. So the designers have been really been helping us uh, uh, with recommendations on how to present the data in order to make it easily uh, discoverable and support uh, active exploration, slicing and dicing of data, annotation down the line of this, uh, of this time series. Uh, uh, again, keep in mind there's uh, a, a nugly lot of data compressed uh, in this dashboard, so we need to find ways uh, of making it uh, easily accessible uh, for our users. Um, so, what are we doing next? Uh, so these are some of the next steps, uh, uh, most of which are relevant for uh, the research uh, side of the project. Uh, so first off, we want to go beyond, once we have this metric implemented, we really want to go beyond uh, the simple signals that are based on edit counts. So the vast majority of these uh, metrics are really based on uh, uh, some derived signal that is based on edit counts. Um, it, they don't really capture the quality of contributions, uh, value-added uh, persistence of, uh, uh, of contributions, and uh, we'll, be able, we'll be able with some, some better metrics once the first signals are implemented to capture, uh, again, via these quantitative proxies, um, phenomena that are probably more interesting than just uh, how many edits uh, people completed in a given day. Um, at the same time, uh, we'll be able to better segment the edit population. Right now, we have this uh, proxy of namespaces uh, that allow us to figure out whether something is uh, um, um, an edit on a talk page or uh, an upload uh, uh, or uh, a contribution to a project uh, uh, discussion. But these are really coarse ways of identifying the types of contributions. So having the ability of saying, well, today we had 30% uh, uh, of all our users doing typo fixing or adding references or uh, reverting vandalism is going to be really one of the big goals. So understanding algorithmically how to break down the, the overall population of contributing users. Um, we're going to include the readership metrics. So we're working hard to make sure that we have uh, an infrastructure uh, and solid definitions to uh, uh, to measure uh, page views and also unique visitors um, on the projects. And most importantly, we're soliciting at every point in this process uh, feedback. Uh, and we're going to run through a uh, a big evaluation process to figure out whether there's something we're not capturing, something we should be capturing with this, uh, uh, with this metric proposal. So that completes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, uh, how can we meaningfully relate these metrics to uh, changes, like for example, abuse filter uh, changes and figure out what it was a, a direct effect. Uh, um, now, the, uh, the proper answer is that uh, we, we can't really establish a, a direct uh, causal relation uh, just by comparing time series, like I said in the beginning. However, I think this, this project will allow us, uh, by combining uh, multiple time series, if we know exactly the time at which uh, a specific change of this filter was deployed, uh, and we see uh, a change in uh, in any of the series that is unlikely to be caused by seasonality or other factors. That that's going to be an interesting initial hook for uh, running dedicated research on that on that problem. So I, I really take this as a as a heuristic tool that may help us really zoom in on interesting projects as opposed to immediately identify causal connections between a change and and, and its impact. Also, because the, the proper way of, uh, of, of uh, uh, assessing this impact is via controlled experiments. That's something we cannot do at scale for all of these uh, changes. Thank you. Yes, over um, there. When thinking about the quality of the edits and how you might measure that in the future, um, what have you thought about in terms of the factors that might give you a, a systematic that 
Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So for now we're using uh, reverts because uh, they're relatively computationally cheap to compute. Um, and there's a pretty solid literature <coughs> about uh, how we can use reverts as a proxy for quality of edits and productivity of editors. But there's uh, actually a pretty interesting literature about uh, tech survival um, if you're familiar with Wikitrust uh, and all of the proposals that we've been basically looking at the uh, uh, at the survival of specific uh, uh, chunks of text uh, in an edit as an indication of the quality of the edit and also as a result uh, the quality of the editor making those changes that are surviving longer. Um, so the next step I think is going to be uh, looking at uh, this approach based on text survival uh, to go beyond uh, the, the pure reader based uh, uh, metrics. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask about how nuanced is the information about the, the devices that are being used. So obviously in some, well not obviously, but in some cases it could be a, a mo increasingly will be mobile phone or tablets or, so how, is there the ability to do that? I mean I know it's very difficult at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So um, excellent question. So in fact, uh, uh, we're committing on delivering by the end of next quarter, um, uh, the first breakdown uh, of these metrics by uh, target site. So the way in which we typically um, talk about these uh, breakdowns, we have uh, different target sites of methods in which people can access the site. So for example, there is the desktop site, there is the mobile site, and now we have uh, native apps, right? And on the other hand, we have different devices. So you have uh, mobile devices, you have tablet devices, you have uh, desktop devices. So we'll be working on uh, providing breakdowns uh, of uh, this, all of these metrics uh, uh, initially by um, target site or method. So you'll be able to know, for example, whether, um, say, look at the, uh, at the um, revert rate uh, of edits uh, on the mobile side as opposed to the desktop side on a per project basis. Um, not yet uh, based on device classes, but probably device classes is going to be the uh, yeah the next priority. So this is happening already. And I, uh, yeah, I think you're right. This is a super important uh, uh, distinction we need to make. Sorry, just to carry on to that, then would you be able to manage like to be able to assess per region or per like geographical area? Because obviously. Yeah. So we're also doing. Um, uh, geographic analysis on an ad hoc basis, so we don't have yet uh, plans to make this um, available via these dashboards. Um, there's actually uh, a more delicate question than uh, the mobile desktop breakdown because there's uh, obviously major privacy implications, like uh, the geographic location of the country of a registered user is something that we don't disclose. Um, but so once we have a proper anonymization aggregation in place, um, uh, we should be able to um, to produce a, a geographic breakdown for these metrics, but it's not something we're planning for the uh, <coughs> short term. Yep. Um, thank you for your work. Um, I was curious, as you've been working on it, have there been any results about the health of different communities that have surprised you? Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, projects that might be taking place that are focused on developing countries. But just yeah, so we have a, this, this presentation was mostly about uh, analytics infrastructure, right? So not so much about research, uh, but we do in fact have a, a, a number of areas that we're exploring more from a research standpoint. Um, in, in my team, this is not so much based on um, geographical regions, so we're not really focused on global south versus global north uh, distinction. But we have uh, uh, quite a few research projects that look at, for example, on a per project basis, what's happening in terms of uh, uh, retention and uh, 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 activation of new users, for example. We've seen some really interesting <coughs> and major differences in what happens to, uh, to new users, for example, uh, as a function of the projects where, where they register. Um, or also retention and active editor uh, trends that, um, that basically we discovered as part of this project. So we had to run a number of, uh, of analyses that basically highlighted uh, uh, areas that we need to, to focus on. So yeah, there's definitely like extra research that we can, we can point you to. Yeah, so I there's a question about uh, how we're looking at measuring value. And it turns out that I have a, a 
presentation here about the, the spaces that we're looking into about measuring value. It's Sunday in this room at 11.30. And it's called Wikicredit Calculating and Presenting Value Contributed to Wikimedia. So if you're interested in that, please come. And also, speaking of uh, other shameless blogs, there's another presentation that Eric Zapta will be giving, uh, I think, tomorrow um, on, uh, be there, Eric? Yes. <laughs> uh, on uh, basically, um, how to present metrics uh, in an honest way and how to uh, lie with metrics uh, and how to be true to metrics. So uh, make sure you attend it if you're interested in this setup. What's it called? Uh, I forgot. <laughs> Not a good name. Wikistats new trends. Wikistats new, Wiki new trends. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.
Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the way it works.
to use that laptop. Is yours a Google presentation? No, it's key. It's key. Yeah, okay. You have to upload to a PDF. I got to do the. This is Yeah. Dario tried to get his, and he had to use this laptop too.